everyone and welcome back to AP Daily Review Sessions. I'm Mrs. Wendy Scruggs. I teach AP English Literature and Composition at Jaifred High School in Fayetteville, North Carolina. For this session, we are going to talk about how to deconstruct an FRQ1 poetry prompt and find evidence to help us write our essay and develop our line of reasoning. So remember, you can download the prompts and the poem in the link provided. So let's get started. Here is the question one poetry prompt from the 2023 AP exam. So remember, we're supposed to first carefully look at what information we're given. So it's worth our time to take a moment before we even read the poem itself and think about and unpack this prompt. So remember, we'll always be given the title of the poem, the poet's name, the year of publication, and so I see this as in 1843, and maybe that will be important to meaning in the poem. It might not, but it could. And then we need to think about what that time period, early 19th century, would mean to us. Maybe it's indicative of a literary period, maybe a historical event. We don't know yet if that would be related to the poem, but it could have an influence on its meaning. So we'll keep that in mind. And then in this prompt, we see the title is The Barren Moors. So even if I'm not sure what a moor is, I mean, we don't usually refer to moors in North Carolina where I am, but I do know what the word barren means. So that starts me thinking something is barren. And then next, we need to remember that we're always going to be given some sort of context or background information to help guide our thinking in the right direction. And here we see moors again, right? just like we had it in our title. And this time, we're given a little definition of what a moor is to actually help us. So don't read this too fast. Open expanses of wild, uncultivated land. Okay, so now that I know what one is and that it's barren or there's nothing there, I can start visualizing this barren land. And the prompt is directing me to analyze how, right, Channing uses literary elements and techniques to develop a complex portrayal of the speaker's experience of this natural setting. So we know we've got to talk about this and focus on this relationship, right? The speaker to the experience of the wild, untamed, barren natural setting has to be addressed in the essay and it has to be talked about how it is a complex experience and portrayal. So we're going to talk about that idea of complex again in a moment, but you do want to take a moment and remind yourself that when I have to have a defensible thesis statement, right? And it's reminding us what we have to do. This is all coming straight from our rubric. It means we have to have a claim maybe someone could disagree with. And I need to do more than just say the speaker has a complex experience. I have to explain in my essay how it is complex. And then I have to find quotes or partial quotes, right, as evidence from the poem to support my thesis or my claim. And then I have to explain how my evidence from the poem proves my thesis. So these bottom four bullets are really here as a great reminder for what I need to include in my essay because, again, they're straight from our grading rubric. Okay, so let's take another look at this prompt, and I want to focus in on this last part of the prompt, the task. In this last sentence, we need to explain how that will give us analysis, right? And then we also have to talk about the literary elements and techniques. It's stated here in our prompt. What does that mean? And it doesn't mean we need to focus on every literary element or technique we can find in the poem. And it also doesn't mean we have to talk about complex elements. It's not the elements that are complex. It's only the speaker's experience or relationship to this natural setting that is complex. And we can use the most simple of common terms used for poetry because most poems will have a speaker and possibly some imagery and maybe some figurative language. And we know in this poem it has setting that's at least important enough to be mentioned in the title. So we want to make sure that we focus on what we do know and not on what we don't. But think for a minute about complexity, and it can mean looking at things that are opposites or paradoxes or contradictions, and it doesn't mean we have to use complex language to talk about our poem. 
So if we're looking at the speaker and the speaker's experience in these moors, then we already know it's going to have many sides to it. It's got to be more than just somebody is out in a barren landscape. So think back to all of those lessons in our AP Daily videos in an AP classroom, and we find shifts and when things change and those shifts are part of complexity. And that means things don't necessarily stay the same. So just like us, we have many facets to us. And so the speaker has many facets to his reaction. And the speaker's experience in this setting, we're already told, is going to have those. So let's visualize this complexity for just a moment. It might look something like this pyramid. Or it may look more like these gears where things are interacting constantly. We won't really know until we read the poem. So now that we've got our brain juices flowing, we're going to read the poem itself, and I want to ask you to read it for a couple of things. Where it seems like the feelings or the emotions shift, and I want you to mark words that jump out at you, and what literary devices you notice after those words jump out at you in each stanza. Remember, you don't have to find every fancy literary device. Find what you know and what you notice that creates meaning and what you would feel comfortable talking about. So please pause the video now and read the poem. Okay, so when I read the poem, one of the first things that stands out to me in this first stanza is on your bare rocks, okay? being repeated. So that should be for emphasis. So I know I have repetition I can talk about, and I also see that the mores are being talked to, like an apostrophe. So now I have some things to work with, and the barrenness or emptiness is jumping out at me as well, right? And I think, well, why would the lack of stuff be emphasized? How would that make someone feel? because it seems kind of lonely to me. And then I see this contradiction in the same stanza because the speaker says, I love to lie. So even though there's nothing there, the speaker loves to lie there alone in this untamed nature. And then I see this simile with the crags. So the rocks stand like crags or something that's hard and it makes sense for rocks, but then they're immediately compared to something soft like clouds. So I see there's complexity or somewhat contradictory feelings already going on in a reaction to the environment for this speaker. Now in the second stanza, I see this repeated idea of things that are lonely or stressing being alone with spaces desolate, his lonely way, solitudes, loneliest day. And I noticed this fox by itself. Maybe that's a symbol. So being alone maybe is what it stands for. I'm not sure. And then I notice another contrast with fairly sate. And that's interesting to me because sate means satisfied. So the speaker says he's satisfied even on a lonely day if he's by himself in this barren, desolate place of moors. And that's not what I expected. So now I want to see why he feels this way in nature. Now in this third stanza, I see this simile comparing the moors like desert islands far at sea. And again, emphasizing this sense of being alone and what we would expect to be lonely. But the speaker says that it, the dim uncertainties, right, stands for something veritable or true. So nature seems to be true to the speaker. And now I start wondering, what is this speaker had as a hardship maybe with people? So maybe that's why the speaker likes or loves to lie in the moors all alone. And I'm on the lookout for anything that would explain why the speaker doesn't mind being away from everybody. And then in the fourth stanza, this jumps out. The moors are a serious place that are separate and very different from everything else that life personified, right? Delights to feel or like. So maybe by life, the speaker means other people and that's contrasted with standing in this deserted hall, a metaphor for the 
s'mores like there's some kind of natural room, maybe since the speaker calls it a hall, right? And then two things really jump out at me in this stanza. I stand, right? So the speaker is standing in nature. And then this last line really seems like a zinger to me. Thus the wounds of time conceal. Ooh, wow. So if the speaker is in nature, he can handle the wounds he's gained in life. Maybe being alone in nature helps not think about what's troubling in society. Not quite sure, but there are a lot of complex and changing emotions going on with this. Now the next stanza, I can see why the speaker likes being alone in nature, even if it is bare. No friend's cold eye. Ouch. Okay. So someone the speaker considers a friend has given him the cold eye, right? And the speaker says this friend who's been cold can't vex me now. So, or cause him problems when the speaker's in the moors. So I see this very precise diction telling me that whatever this friend has been saying or doing can't disturb the peace of the speaker and at least the quiet that the speaker can find in the moors, right? Now in the next stanza, the speaker says how he can't be touched in these distant wolds or hills. And this makes sense that the speaker feels that the agitating world, right, can't get to him in the distant world. So whatever the friend has done to the speaker, it cannot affect the speaker while the speaker's in the moors. And then the speaker even calls the moors with this metaphor, a dreamy home, right? So it seems like it's a comfort, a place where he feels like he can belong. So that's not what I expect of being alone in a desolate place. Then in this final stanza, I see the speaker is talking to the Moors, addressing them again with an apostrophe, with, oh, barren Moors. And then I notice that idea of a pensive thought in the stanza before, which we have here, is repeated. The speaker says it again, this idea of standing in these last two lines, right? And so... Earlier, the speaker said the more stand like something true, so unlike the friend, apparently. So this speaker, to me, seems to emphasize he's found some sort of peace in the moors, even though they may seem lonely on the surface. And this brings to my mind things my mother has said to me that, you know, people can be alone in a crowd, and maybe that's how this speaker is feeling. So by tracking the stanzas and the shifts and just the things that jumped out, right, um, we can see the speaker's experience grow and change and evolve so that nature gives some sort of peace or solace or truth that the speaker wasn't finding when he's with people. And so I can develop these into a line of reasoning. And I found my textual support already, how these details will stand out for me. So there are many things we can talk about in this. But the final thing for me that really makes me think the speaker feels connected to nature despite being alone or without any people are that we have these every other line rhyming in each stanza. So these pairs, maybe the speaker feels paired with nature as someone to comfort. So that's an interesting way for me to talk about why there's a rhyme there. So I want you to visualize this, even though I'm sure other details and literary techniques, because this is chock full of them, probably stood out to you. There's so many to pick from. So what we just need to remember is that we need to write about what we know, and we need to write about what we know that can create meaning. And then we want to take those many layers of meaning that we just tracked through whatever details and devices that stood out, and we want to organize them into our line of reasoning. So you may want to just make yourself a simple chart like this. It's nothing complex here, just to help you organize your thoughts as you go and as you're annotating. So if we track how the emotions evolve and shift throughout the poem, we just fill in our textual support in our chart with partial quotes or key phrases. And then what literary technique or element it is and answer how we know that with a brief explanation. That's how we develop our line of reasoning. So here I've just given some sample emotions or experiences the speaker may experience. And then I just fill all those basics in we just talked about into each of the spots. So I know I'm focused while I write. 
I know everything's related to each other and that I would be supporting my thesis because that's the whole point of it. Well, I hope that this practice with finding evidence to develop a line of reasoning for an FRQ1 poetry prompt has been helpful and have a great rest of your day.